Hello. Hi. Hello, Amy. Hi. Hi, Paul. Hi, Solomon. Can I introduce you to Hans and Alex? I don't know where Alex went. So there yeah. he is. He, he somehow shifted to another side of my Zoom window. Um, Hi. So you and um, Paul and Amy, Hans and Alex, they've been working with Rainier on the seminar. Right. Ah, Rainier, you're here. Hi. 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 You're in. You're in another part. So shall we um, get started? I will just. Uh, well, I would just like to welcome everybody. Um, uh, so let me first um, introduce uh, Rainier de Graff uh, and Hans and Alex, who he's been working with, um, who has been leading um, this seminar. So it's been a pleasure and we're looking forward to the results. Um, I'd like to um, uh, welcome our guests, um, uh, Paul Chan, who um, is from our faculty. He's a professor of uh, design and construction management and his scholarship focuses on the processes that enable whole life thinking and the development and realization of building projects. Um, so he's particularly interested in uh, developing future practices uh, in tandem with uh, new technologies. So um, basically the idea is to build or to explore how to contribute to constructing better buildings and hence better communities. So I think his profile is very well suited to a lot of um, the uh, work that Rainier is thinking about here. Then we have Amy Thomas, who is also from our faculty, who's an assistant professor, and her scholarship um, focuses on the relationship between financial processes and the built environment and the role played by commercial architects and developers in particular. Um, her forthcoming book to be published um, in 2021 by the MIT Press charts the development of London's financial district, the city of London, um, in the decade following the Second World War, investigating the relationship between the uh, economy and uh, built in change. And then I am hearing myself here in the background. Um, I don't know if Patrice is logged in yet. Um, I don't see her, but um, I guess she will be joining us at, uh, at a moment. Um, she's still on East Coast time. We have uh, Patrice Darrington, who will also be joining, who's the Holiday Associate Professor and Director of the Real Estate Development Program at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. And she's basically very much interested in integrating academia and industry so uh, to build an innovative knowledge base uh, for the real estate profession. So, um, uh, well, and in the wonderful issue of Baumeister that Rainier edited last year, uh, she contributed a very um, nice piece uh, related to her forthcoming book by Berghauser on, um, well, real estate development in essentially 16th century uh, London. So a sort of a, a foil to uh, Amy's book. But at any rate, um, uh, I guess we should get started. And then we hope that uh, uh, Patrice will be joining us and I'll be checking my email too to see <laughs> what happened there. Um, but since we have a kind of uh, public audience on the other end, I think that we should get started with the um, uh, intro introduction. Okay, 
So okay. uh, the floor is yours. So um, yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, okay, uh, let's see if I have control. I don't, yeah, I do, uh, sorry. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, give a short uh, intro into the subject matter. Uh, of the studio uh, entitled uh, The Asset Class, together with uh, Hans Larsson uh, and, and uh, Alexandre Uretagan, we will explain uh, the premise uh, of the whole thing. Uh, and then, uh, without much further ado, hand over to uh, the student. So, uh, the explanation is quite simple. Um, this is, well, Everybody will, will know what this is. Uh, but I think the interesting uh, thing about the image is that all of us know this uh, as a piece of architecture. Uh, however, uh, a building like this uh, uh, also has uh, another life. All right, sorry. I, I don't have control for some reason. Oh, I can just click. A building like this also has uh, another life, which is uh, at least, um, if not more important than the life that we uh, as, architect, um, uh, as architects know, and uh, perhaps worryingly uh, very much um, uh, absent uh, of our radar. And, and it is our assumption that if uh, this life would be more present, on our radar, it might also significantly help our uh, our course uh, uh, as architects. Building cost buildings cost money, uh, of that we are uh, acutely aware as architects. But buildings also represent money. Uh, buildings also make money. Buildings have lives as as economic assets uh, long after we have uh, fled uh, the scene, and that is a life. Uh, that doesn't just take part place after we have left. It actually also affects, in many ways, our labor more than we would care to uh, admit. Uh, let me uh, explain. So uh, there is the cost associated with building, the cost of the acquisition of the land, uh, the cost of uh, construction. Uh, then there is the architect's uh, fee, a humiliatingly tiny percentage uh, even uh, here. Then there is, uh, of course, the cost of finances it to, to the legal cost. Uh, and uh, then there is a, a slight profit for a developer. Uh, and this, these are numbers related to the gherkin. So uh, to, to make this building come to life, uh, there is a sum of, of about 366 uh, million pounds uh, associated with it. Uh, then we leave. And then essentially this happens. The building uh, gets uh, sold a number of times uh, and all of a sudden its value trumps uh, to over a billion. Um, the gherkin in, in particularly tripled in value in the 15 years after it was realized, which means that in a way the cost incurred to make the building were recouped threefold after the building uh, had been uh, made, um, which of course makes any association of a cost cut uh, or, or, or uh, a reduction of fees uh, a, a rather uh, nasal uh, uh, affair. The fact that buildings or real estate uh, can, can generate such returns, such stratospheric returns as in the case of the Gherkin, is having a profound effect on, on many aspects uh, of our lives, uh, even on, uh, interestingly, on the aspects we consider most authentic, uh, historic, and unalterable. Even if you look at something like Venice 
or if you look at something like the uh, inner city uh, historic center uh, of Amsterdam, uh, a vast majority of that real estate is long in the hands of, uh, of foreign uh, investors. In 2017, over 70% of purchases in the Netherlands were made by foreign uh, investors. And they buy these things largely to sell them at a higher price uh, later. And, and of course, all of that has an interesting uh, uh, effect, not only on the types of tenure, but also on the prices of things uh, themselves, almost irrespective of the material value. Uh, to give a few examples, this is a Chinese cook, uh, 16 million euro uh, dollars for uh, an expensive penthouse in, in, in Amsterdam. That is a very, very high price for Dutch standards, but it pales into insignificance with some of the prices that are paid for property uh, along Central Park, 45 million, the then record for a penthouse uh, along uh, the Central Park by the vector director. Uh, the high uh, King property, uh, tycoon Nick Candy. Uh, this is along Hyde Park, the project Hyde Park One. He paid an honorable sum of 160 million pounds for a, a penthouse. And interestingly, he bought that from himself. One, co one of his companies bought it from another one of his companies to simply set an entry level, almost like an auction uh, for, for the prices of these um, apartments. This um, uh, was uh, another record uh, by Michael Dell, uh, who, who bought a, a, a penthouse inside uh, Fignoli's Park Avenue Tower. Now, all of that is interesting. I mean, so there is an effect uh, on, on prices, but there is also an effect, uh, interestingly, on, 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 on the way these buildings that are subject to this are used. If we look at uh, the Vignoli Tower, uh, you look at a picture and it seems like tenants have made a coordinated effort to simply put the lights on on every 14th floor uh, of the whole thing, almost like a kind of... Uh, uh, light art, uh, light choreography, but on closer inspection, you actually see that every every 14 floors there is a plant room uh, which is lit because for most part, uh, despite the uh, uh, excessive sales, uh, this tower remains uh, empty, and and this tower is particularly uh, prominent. Uh, precisely because of a number of very high marketed sales to uh, celebrities. Uh, this is a Qatari businessman, $16.2 million, three bedroom condominium. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's clearly that he himself doesn't live there. This looks like a furniture showroom where the furniture is brought in and otherwise never touched. Another example, uh, 87 uh, million for a penthouse. Same thing, a furniture showroom, uh, but doesn't, uh, nobody lives there. Uh, Jennifer Lopez and Alex Rodriguez, a 15.3 million condo uh, in the building for their love nest. And this is their love nest, largely a bed that has never, uh, ever, ever slept in. So one uh, wonders, uh, what, what is the effect on architecture if it's bought not to use, but primarily to sell. If the use uh, is nothing more than a number uh, on, on a balance uh, sheet, and the use and the function of a building is in a way a mere alibi for the building being uh, a, an asset which is traded. One, uh, one sees the effect on form in a way on the Vignoli Tower, uh, designed so that uh, the apartments have as few neighbors as possible, almost like a series of stacked furniture showrooms. Uh, this is another uh, example of the shop tower, uh, even higher, uh, even thinner. And you could sort of imagine a speculative end to this progress uh, process where uh, no longer uh, uh, do you actually need to entertain the function uh, as an alibi, but uh, in a way, a building is what it truly is, is a form of concrete. Uh, sculpture or even uh, a sculpture in a considerably more expensive uh, material. This is, of course, it seems very, very uh, far-fetched. Uh, but if you look at the Manhattan skyline, it's maybe not that uh, far-fetched in the sense that also here, by and large, the real estate boom is a question of not necessarily people looking for a home, but capital 
looking for a home. Money that with historically low interest rates uh, is actually looking for a way to create a greater uh, return and finding a very, very convenient home uh, in the form of uh, real estate. If you look at the global uh, assets and at the asset classes uh, of which the global economy consists, you see actually that the largest uh, asset value is concentrated in real estate, uh, more than in oil reserves, more than in the world gold reserves, cryptocurrencies and everything. So there is a curious uh, contradiction uh, between the ever greater reliance of the economic system on buildings and the ongoing marginalization of architecture uh, as a profession. And in the context of that space, uh, we want it uh, to do this studio and I'll hand over to Hans uh, from here. Yeah, thank you, Rainier. Uh, so indeed, what did we do in the studio? Um, what the asset class studio set out to do was essentially to track um, the impact on architecture of the desires uh, and wishes to turn it into an appealing commodity and all the various ways that this happens. Uh, so what might this mean? It could mean uh, take a city like Toronto, or it could be Chicago, where there's uh, a rising demand for unique and individual balconies. Um, and how do you cater to this demand uh, while facing economic pressures to build at an appealing uh, rate? Um, well, solutions can be found, and they can be found quite easily, um, whether it comes in the highly ornamental uh, yet individual balconies in the tower in Chicago, which, as we see in the floor plan, uh, have no impact on the essential efficiency of the building. Um, in many cases, uh, buildings are constructed under the imperative of the creation of uh, the most appealing view possible, um, which creates floor plans like this uh, that could, in other cases, be considered to be an unfinished or a half-finished building, uh, but in this case work just fine. Um, of course, views normally we want to have, for example, in a city like London in all directions, and the floor plan follows suit um, with a highly efficient disposition of viewing angles towards all possible directions. Um, and um, the examples abound, of course, uh, we can want to have a view looking in all directions, but also we might want to park our SUV in an automatic elevator, which takes us up to our 35 floor uh, penthouse. Uh, and of course, this phenomenon is not only present in individual buildings, it's also been the motif for the construction of entire cities. We see Benidorm in the 30s, uh, and we see Benidorm today. Um, and uh, it could be described in some ways as a city which was constructed entirely to look in one direction, uh, the ocean. And so what the studio set out to do uh, was to track these phenomena um, as they might occur all over the planet. And in this, we were aided by a cohort, um, the 30th generation of the Berlach, which also fortunately for us hails from uh, all manner of uh, locations as well. Um, but uh, not only the students, but also the guests that were invited, um, we sought to involve um, essentially the voices of the roles occurring outside of the architectural discipline. So we talked to Jose Luis Camarasa, the municipal architect of Benidorm, uh, who was invited for one session. Uh, also Bas Van Dam, uh, head of being development in the Netherlands, a, a branding and marketing consultant, Kaz Faisi from ING Media, and uh, last but not least, Jordi Kleemans from Savills, Netherlands, uh, a real estate consulting agency. Okay, can you hear? Um, so more than uh, just uh, looking at uh, the occurrence of this phenomenon of how architecture is being distorted by capital, we have come across a number of examples that actually turn out to um, contradict uh, uh, common knowledge that is present in the practice of uh, real estate uh, development, for instance. In the, so in the name for profit, uh, in, investors are looking for ways to maximize uh, the amount of floor space. Uh, there are, however, uh, 
buildings that actually make more money from other uh, in other ways and uh, our first uh, student felipe will show you a very interesting example uh, of such a building um, it is also expected that um, a building that uh, prioritizes uh, iconicity uh, to uh, provide a way to um, reveal uh, its uh, its destination, its use, would uh, have a compromise over its uh, functionality. However, uh, we have found plenty of examples uh, which prove uh, the contrary. Green is good, everyone agrees that, but uh, is it uh, really the case uh, at at what cost does it uh, come to uh, to have uh, green architecture? Um, also, Marco will uh, show you a very interesting investigation into what lies behind uh, green architecture. Big buildings uh, 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 is expected that to require powerful uh, and rich investors. However, we have uh, also come across uh, uh, interesting examples that show that uh, uh, through a collection of uh, smaller and many uh, investors, uh, you can achieve the same uh, degree of ambitions. Mm. Immovable property uh, appreciates over time. That's what uh, every uh, real estate investor uh, will tell you. However, is it really always the case? Uh, we have come across a very interesting typology that uh, actually proves uh, to be even more valuable over time than what is uh, commonly known uh, about fixed assets. Um, density is a buzzword that uh, is present uh, uh, in planning uh, these days. And of course, uh, it's uh, seen from a uh, point of view of sustainability, of ecological impact, but First and foremost, uh, it is uh, the most effective way to make the land pay, the, to make the best uh, use of, um, of land. Again, we have uh, um, proven that this is not always the case. We have uh, found uh, examples uh, where actually the unbuilt can be even more profitable than uh, the built. Um, a place uh, that uh, is unique is considered to be uh, valuable and, and therefore appealing. But what does it happen actually if uh, such a place is being replicated throughout the world? What is the value of uh, such replicas? Uh, we will find out uh, uh, in a few moments about that also. And uh, the last... Um, last myth that we busted uh, in this uh, series um, of seminars it's uh, the uh, common mantra of real estate location 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 is it really the case that uh, uh, this applies to every situation we will uh, also show you a very interesting situation where actually um, quite the opposite is true so uh, having gone through all this um, uh, examples, I would now like to give the floor to our students and invite uh, Felipe to talk about the first case, uh, namely how uh, uh, buildings can make more money from uh, in other ways than just floor areas. Yeah, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, so uh, the subject is the billboard building. More floor is not equal to more money. This is, as we all know, Times Square. The building in the center of the slide is one Times Square named after the New York Times, which first erected the building in 1908. Forward today, and now you will see an overwhelming amount of digital billboards, and it all started with this building. In actuality, the building is one of the most expensive rented outdoor billboard spaces in the world. Hugely contrasting to the lively facade, the interior remains totally abandoned with the exception of some floors. The illustrated book of Joe McKendry captures beautifully the result in 1908 and how it evolved to become a billboard building. 
The tower is located at the bow tie shaped square that interrupts the orthogonal grid of Manhattan. The floor plan is the first ground floor to have access to the first line of the Metro of New York. It's limited uh, square meters made it very hard for the building to have a high revenue and its pristine location within the city was a wasted opportunity to make big money. In 1992, the new owners of the building decided to avoid investing in fixing the interior to make it inhabitable, but to start selling facade area for advertisement. As you can see in this graph, that shows the value of the venue related to time. Changing its function was the smartest decision. According to 2012 data, the building was worth $495 million. Following is the information about the billboard and some of the brands which had rented the space in the past and in the past, and a comparison of the floor area versus facade area. As we can see, the square meters are very similar to each other. And by having the information of the rent price by square meter, we could determine that if the building was to be an office, today it will only have a 9 million revenue compared to the 24 million the building produces today. Challenging the common understanding that floor area equals revenue and facade area equals expenditures. What if we could intentionally design a building which with limited floor area, but with a potential to use a large facade. For the speculation, the city of Paris was chosen. Its house many and grid with roads that connect the most important monuments of Paris allow for interesting findings. As you zoomed in, the intersections of these roads created acute angles and impossible sites to be built upon, especially in the pedestrian base within the road intersection an opportunity to fill these empty lots and create revenue out of thin air. Three sites were selected with the purpose of transforming them into high notes of advertisement in the outside, but with benevolent intentions of, for the interior. Cult cultural and sport venues with vertical nature is innate, nature is innate and therefore making it an obvious connection to the morphology. The library, the climbing wall, and the aerial yoga studio. The idea is that the height is not randomly given, but the result of a calculated equation from the rent price of the surrounding area and taking into account the outdoor advertisement price per square meter. One can calculate how much facade area of height is needed to create the same amount of profit and even surpass these numbers. What if these lender advertisement towers were spread across Paris. Maybe any speculation of the possible sites for the repetition of the phenomenon? What if they were to challenge the horizontal context and transform the city into a radical money maker? And with that, I'm finished. Sorry for that. Technical issues. Okay, so the next example is the metaphorical buildings. What you see does not equal to what you get. What you see is the Albanian territory. What you also see is a building that uses this metaphor it's an asset to double its square meter price compared to the new apartments around the area. What you see is basically a duck in Venturian sense. Hence, what you think you'll get is a strange plan. However, what you actually get, it's a conventional normal plan and also a decorated shed that according to MBRDV, is able to point out the precise location of your home based on the geography of Albania, quote unquote, somebody could live in the Tirana pixel 
somebody else in the Durex pixel. What you see is a traditional Chinese vault protector coin. What you get is a building in China that has a significant higher rental price compared to the offices around the area. What you basically see is a duck. And what you get is both a duck and a decorated shed, or simply a metaphor. What you see, well, you already know what you see, and you already guessed it right. However, what you don't know is that the National Fisheries Development Building is lit in blue light, which at night resembles a fish underwater. What you also couldn't guess is a funny looking urban plan. By now you think what a strange plan that must be. Wrong. We make jokes, they make money. What you see is a beer. What you get is both a symbol of the soul of the company and the Max Bolstadt signature label, which was a designer, a designer turned architect. And again, the same issue, perfectly normal plan, even interesting. What you see is the canal houses in Delphware. And what you also see is canal houses in Delphware. However, where you get to live is tailored identity houses. You actually get to live in the metaphorically reproduced houses of Vermeer, Hugo de Groot, and Rainer de Graaf, uh, the other one. <laughs> what you also see is hotels adapting to the same strategies. As the metaphor extrapolates its market research tool to attribute a particular sign that does not relate to the building function, but it does to its economical value. The metaphor takes advantage of the duck and the decorated shed by absorbing attention without hindering the programmatic flow of the building. What you see is new, luxurious, fantastical, extraordinary six-star hotel and luxury apartments. What you get is crazy economical returns and also an identity. And in the age of total dissipation of identity, you wouldn't pay more to get it. And the list goes on, of course. Uh, what remains is that the metaphor fundamentally dispatches itself from the conventionalities of architecture to the fields of economics, subverting both form follows function and function follows form to simply form and function follow economics. Now what you see is a guitar and you can guess Right, yeah, this is the hard rock hotel. That means you get a corporate identity and plus extraordinary uh, cash returns. The metaphor that stretches when tourists learning from Las Vegas to its breaking limit, only to establish a schizophrenic relationship with the architecture of science. The metaphor in the age of ever shorter attention span translate the flatness of images science into an iconography of three dimensional spaces. What you see here is a wooden basket, multiplied size with 160, and what you used to get is office to the company um, that made these baskets. I say used to because from 2020, you get a luxury hotel. The company went almost bankrupt a few years ago and the new owners saw an opportunity. And um, yeah, they, they want to convert it to a luxury hotel. Um, this was announced a few months ago. Here what you see is what you actually get. So this is the range of translating metaphors from abstract to literal. So the literal translation would be the, the less building that you saw, the more abstract, the one with a, with a beer. Um, and also the translation of the metaphor from uh, and the use of, 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 of identity as an, as an asset for the metaphor, that means corporate identity, cultural identity, national identity, and we've sort of separated this. So if the Las Vegas strip was full of science and architecture of ducks, the metaphorical strip is full of ducks projected as signs onto the building's packaging. That means it's elevation. Finally, the packaging is nothing but a commercial tool, studied and perfected to please each context subliminal desires. When the building stops being a building, it becomes more rather than less. And for this, we developed 10 scenarios. Lam, okay. would you like to sell them? Uh, yes, yeah, so I will tell about the 10 proposal for building metaphor. 
we it's like a way to make up to existing building to make it more attractive. This one is a residence building in Hong Kong. And we convert it with a metaphor of corn. It means you can have a lot of offsprings, just like a corn, which is a good meaning in Chinese content. And this is a CCB office building, also in Hong Kong. We convert it into a, a camera. And this one, the next one, is a hotel in Netherlands. We use the element of windmill, which is a symbol of Netherlands. And the next one, the, the region bank building in Tenasi. We convert it into a microphone because Tinasa is the origin of country music. And the next one, the Sasak office building in Beijing. We use a metaphor of a sword. A sword would bring you good luck in overcoming problems in Chinese content. And the next one, here we have a Mar um, Marriott Hotel in Shanghai. And we convert it into a rocket which have a meaning of faster, stronger, and higher. And the next one, this is the uh, headquarter of Louis Vuitton in Shanghai. So we do this to make it uh, L and V, which representing Louis Vuitton perfectly. And next one, the techno import, uh, import building in Romania, we convert it into a Coca-Cola can. And the next one, the Sharon, <coughs> Sheraton Hotel in Huzhou in China, we make the building into a perfect eight. If you see it with a reflection, eight is the most uh, lucky number in China. And the last one uh, is a residence in Chongqing, China. A metro goes through this building, so we use a metaphor of dragon to it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's what we have. Hello, um, we are uh, dealing with the uh, Bosco Verticale and our basic equation uh, hypothesis, hypothesis is green equals uh, no good. So from the ancient hanging gardens of Babylon, the engineering behind buildings that uh, contain, contain trees um, entail phenom phenomenological uh, reflections, the dichotomy between urban and rural, uh, nature and artificial, function and ornament, cost and benefit. Uh, the energy crisis in the 70s uh, uh, triggered uh, ideals of, of green buildings, but somehow this, this phenomenon seems uh, somehow relevant. Uh, Bosco Verticale is a flagship uh, residential building by Boeri Architects, and uh, it is located in, in Milan in the expansion of the city in Porta Nuova district, uh, where massive developments uh, are, are taking place in the last decade. Um, the typical ground floor of the, of the, the typical floor of the, of the residential tower is, is, is quite conventional in a way, but it remarks the, these balconies in cantilever and uh, the trees that are placed in there. Um, the same, we studied the, the, the logic of the structure behind it uh, to kind of uh, find uh, calculations or estimation of how much this, 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 this green or and this, this, this greenery and these trees uh, imply in the construction of the building. A uh, quote by Boeri in, in, in website and articles around the project. Uh, that providing an amount of vegetation equ equivalent to 30,000 square meters of woodland and undergrowth concentrated on 3,000 square meters of urban surface. So in a way, the tower promises uh, 10 times uh, of woodland in the, in, in the, in the outskirts of Milan. Uh, but doing a simple calculation of, the, of how much green they, they, they actually have in the building, um, we estimated that the actual uh, green that they, they they have in the towers are uh, one uh, ten percent of the of the promised. So in a way, this is the equivalence of, of woodland uh, from the discourse to the actual building. Yeah, and then here um, we basically um, used the budget that uh, was required to build 
the green in, in Bosco in Bosco Verticale, and um, um, and we we wanted to see um, how much per square meter uh, does it cost to to build this vertical green, and we compare it. So we ended up with a number of a thousand euro for square meter, uh, which of course uh, compared to uh, 20 euros for square meters to build a, a urban park. So let's say a, a normal horizontal park or six euro per square meter for a, a national park or uh, 12 cents for a, a natural forest, um, it becomes quite uh, absurd. Uh, and then uh, we uh, we applied, let's say, with the same budget, uh, we 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 try to see uh, how much of these four kinds of green we could get. So with Bosco Verticale, of course, we result with the actual site of Bosco Verticale, which is three thousand square meters. But with the others, uh, the numbers uh, are, of course, uh, much much bigger. Um, and yeah, this is this shows uh, the green propaganda made by Boeri in the uh, recent years after the um, uh, the boom uh, made in Milan. He expanded and started building in Eindhoven, uh, Frankfurt, um, ending up in uh, also in China. Basically, basically the project has been packaged scaled up and exported no to exactly all the con all the continents yeah so yeah so it became that so the the tree the, the the green became this product that was produced and sold all over the world uh, but as we found out where is posturing it uh, results in a, it results more cosmetic and superficial uh, as it only gives the appearance of sustainability without actually tackling the issues of sustainability. So this ostentation of green that leads to uh, a kind of propaganda of architectural, environmental and social virtues uh, is what we've called this uh, pseudo moral efficiency. Um, and, but uh, certainly we learn something from Boeri and is that since the promise of sustainability has became has become um, marketable then the trees uh, has become a product and then green uh, an asset so in a sense we aim to reverse the logic of uh, of greenwashing and it's deceptive sustainability and this is our uh, green propaganda which is the which has the uh, objective of uh, de democratizing green uh, by exploiting it, its e economical value basically uh, so moral efficiency actually becomes our motto uh, which entails reforestations the um, uh, protection of, protection of natural uh, reserves uh, and and uh, inexpensive, uh, inexpensive green architecture, of course. Um, so the mobilization of uh, military forces will uh, serve us as basically uh, will serve the fundamental issue um, uh, of reforestation. So American uh, aircraft carriers will be converted into a kind of uh, NOAA's fleet of uh, green and Russia and Zeppelin will spread seeds all over the world. Um, and so in our business scheme, the, the forest doesn't need to interrelate with the building to, uh, to become an asset um, because the tree is uh, real estate per definition. And that's it for now. Um, hello. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this uh, equation that says big buildings is not equal to big money. So to begin with, uh, the real estate, as we all know, is usually on the service of a few rich investors. 
Um, and skyscrapers are a symbol of wealth and power of a company or a pop magnate in a way. So I'm gonna talk about an alternative investment method that has been growing uh, over time. That is the crowdfunding that is uh, recently entering the built environment investments. So uh, I'm gonna show you some examples that you maybe you didn't know they were crowdfunded because I didn't know at the beginning of the research and is the, the, Liber the Statue of Liberty in New York. Uh, its pedestal was uh, crowdfunded, crowdfunded in, in 1885 and through the newspaper ads. Then also we all know this Sagrada Familia example, which is a building, it's a church that is still being uh, developed or constructed uh, with the money that they gather from donations when you visit, when, when tourists visit this building. Uh, so this is how crowdfunding platforms look today. Uh, this, uh, Platforms are based on private investors that uh, invest a minimum investment of from, they range from $500 to $20,000. And you can select uh, the project you would like to invest. It's a, it's making, it, it makes it more uh, accessible for uh, private investors to invest through these websites. And in a way, it democratizes, uh, democratizes the real estate. And you can, you can check like the internal rate of return and the location of the project you want to invest through these websites. Uh, of course, this crowdfunding uh, investment method involves a lot of like, legal controversies because it hasn't been regulated uh, by the governments. So uh, a lot of these uh, CEOs of these companies have been have gone to jail or have been uh, like dealing with lawsuits. Uh, like in the case of China, the, the Wuhan Greenland Center is, uh, the guy was, uh, yeah, put into jail. Then, so we picked, we selected three uh, of the buildings uh, we thought were the most interesting. We picked these three case studies uh, and yeah, we selected these uh, three skyscrapers or towers because they represent uh, a bigger risk because of course, the, of course, the bigger the project, the bigger the risk. So the first example is the Vidi Bacata in Bogota, Colombia. It's a skyscraper that it uh, was uh, planned to be delivered, initially delivered in 2014, and it's still going on on the works because they haven't reached the, the money they need, and the company went bankrupt. Then the Wuhan Greenland Center, that um, it was planned to have 455 meters height, and uh, 610 meters height, sorry, and then it ended up being 455 because also the company went bankrupt. And then the last example is the AKA United Nations in Manhattan which changed the, it was a renovation that changed the, the program of an existing building, a, a residential project into a luxury and hotel. So yeah, the first example I was, as I was saying, uh, it stopped for two years because they didn't reach the money they needed to, uh, to continue working. And it is okay in the city center of Bogota is one of, one of the most ambitious projects in, in Colombia right now. Uh, we made a simulation which kind of shows the fluctuation value of the investment expressed as architecture. So as more, as the um, as they crowdfunded more money and the building started to grow in a way. So they started with the first stage of the first tower, and then when they reach more money, they started the second tower. And yeah, then we made, made some math and $20,000 was the minimum investment for this uh, project. And that equals to nine square meters in the project. So in a way with the investment you made, you will be owning in a way the, a living room of one of the apartments. Uh, then this is the second uh, case study. This is the Wuhan Greenland. So yeah, uh, we also made the simulation. So it was supposed to end uh, in 606 and it ended up 455 meters. And then the third case study in, in Manhattan. And from all of this, uh, we learned that we learned that it actually, uh, we started to trace the map and it's a, it's a phenomena uh, started in the US, but then it started to grow to Europe and to Asia. And so the first uh, scenario, we were planning to do is to renovate the Bush and Moore. This is a, an abandoned building that was uh, that has been abandoned for 40 years in Beirut. It played a huge role in the um, 
Lebanese civil war. So we thought it was interesting to crowdfund. So it will start to gradually be inhabited by uh, investors that in the first stage will be like an entire renovation of the interior. And the second stage will consist on adding an external structure, everything crowdfunded. Then, uh, so this is a simulation. It, it will start uh, yeah, like being occupied inside. And it will be the model that will be added in the second stage as balconies or loggias. So the, the project will start growing. And the thing is that, uh, yeah, this project will go on building forever. If, if the money reaches to this point, it will start growing really high. Then the second scenario, uh, it goes further because it explores the possibility of crowdfunding a city or a master plan uh, for an agricultural city in Kerala that is a, a um, farmer's village that suffers from floods. So we put we, uh, people will crowdfund this money to for a good cause, and it has a structural grid in squares that allows the building to grow, uh, depending on the money that uh, we crowdfund or that we gather. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hello. So we move to um, a smaller scale. So in the early, early 20th century, owning a mobile home uh, meant vacationing for the wealthy American people, attaching a little trailer to the back of their cars to explore the country. Travelers or so-called tin can tourists began to settle in parks and beaches. Cities endorsed it by establishing areas on where to park. Um, mobile homes uh, started to be advertised for recreational purposes with the idea outdoors in your backyard. After years of signifying a modern lifestyle, the Great Depression and the World War II uh, brought a completely different uh, connotation to the mobile homes, uh, like, the veteran, the, like the veterans uh, who resided in mobile homes due to post-war housing crisis. This form of housing remained uh, as, an, um, as an affordable option and mobile home parks began uh, spreading year by year. Um, the dimensions of a prototypical single wide mobile home uh, are 18 by 5 meters with small variations. So with no foundations needed, the mobile home can be transported everywhere. Even though it's mobile, it's not easy to be moved. Uh, once it settles, uh, it is expensive and infeasible to move. Uh, so it ends up being in a fixed place. Uh, cities reacted by pushing them into marginal land on the outskirts, and given they are uh, not considered actual real estate, uh, they eventually settled on land that wasn't zoned residential, but uh, mostly commercial and industrial areas, uh, almost always surrounded by natural parks and nature. Uh, the mobile home became a ticket to pristine green locations, and the fact that it's temporary and kind of movable allows it to be in an environment, in an environment sorry, where proper real estate actually cannot exist. Um, Halifax Estates in the US is a resident-owned community, and it's one of these examples. Uh, this mobile uh, home park follows the distribution of plots resembling a parking lot. We actually could describe the mobile home, uh, as a, um, uh, the mobile home park as a piece of urbanism that can colonize the forest. Uh, the mobile home park, uh, as a car, depreciates in value over time, but since it can go closer to a forest or an attractive location, uh, the depreciation in value of the object is offset against the value of its context. Um, in the Hamptons, even though the homes are the typical single wide mobile home type, their, their luxurious location allows them to be sold as high as one, two, uh, even as close as $3 million. To further emphasize the idea of the places where a mobile home can go, we gather a few examples from the US where nearly 18 million people live in mobile homes. Parks began by settling in zones that were not residential and with time and regulations gained their condition as one. Rural surrounded by conservation, mobile home park districts surrounded by open space farming, so outdoors in your, in your balcony, agricultural zones and within central business district strips. 
Even in recent years, Amazon benefits from this very condition of the proximity of its fulfillment centers and mobile home parks. They implemented what they call the Camper Force program, where they partnered up with mobile home park owners and hired people living in RVs as temporal employees during peak holiday shopping seasons to work at, at their facilities. So if a mobile home can settle in of limit sites where immobile state cannot, and if a mobile home does not require foundations and can flourish in locations with inhabitants in close proximity to nature, and if a single wide mobile home can be both an affordable and luxurious form of housing, can we mobilize a home park and strategically mobilize it towards an urban cost that benefits from inhabitation? Every year, the Netherlands produces 60 million tons of waste from which 3% is suitable for landfill. Current regulations and policies allow the country to recycle, incinerate, and export much of its waste. However, new laws and the increasing price for exporting waste out of Europe are leading the country to develop new landfill strategies. On the first stage, in the pure style of traditional Dutch terps, new amounts of 2 million square meters of compacted garbage are scattered across the plain territory of the Green Heart. In communities of 500 units, single wide mobile homes are deployed on top to fertilize the land. On a second stage, and over the course of 50 years, the Netherlands starts to import garbage from neighboring European countries to save the country from flooding. Landfill stripes are established throughout the coastline with luxury mobile home parks on top, offering stunning views to the sea. An unfamiliar topography takes place in flatland. Sorry, we tend to think density equals yields. But when we look at the country club, we can see that the lush open green courses are often used to sell homes at high premiums. This was not always the case though. When golf originated in uh, 18th and 19th century Scotland, it was played outside the city on narrow strips of sandland by the sea. This particular condition meant that the golf course was pretty much a linear thing. Only when the game moved inland and eventually to the United States did they become more compact. This was simply a cheaper uh, way to construct them. Notably, many of these types of golf courses were developed by golf equipment manufacturers already saw an opportunity to sell a different product by the development of these courses. Only in America did golf courses enter the development of uh, real estate uh, neighborhoods. At first, they were uh, placed on the parameter of the neighborhood to shield it and make it more exclusive. In the decades that followed, the golf course started entering the urban fabric and the idea of the view on a golf course became an important asset. In the post-war period, and especially in the 60s and 70s, this is taken to new extremes when the golf course is twisted and turned in all sorts of ways to create as many homes as possible with impeccable views on the golf course. This reaches a peak probably in Palm Springs, where dozens of golf courses create a patchwork of artificial green space in the desert of California. Obviously, this forms a stark contrast to the original golf course in Scotland. The, the golf game spread throughout the world, but is, remained mostly popular among English-speaking countries. Specifically in the Americas, it has become uh, an, an important tool in real estate-driven developments. It is perhaps unsurprising then to see how uh, the Dow Jones Index, an important economic indicator, runs almost in tandem with uh, the annual openings of golf courses over the past uh, 100 years or so. Only uh, since the 2008 crisis do you see that this has changed. But even though 
the economy recovered, golf, golf course constructions have remained uh, only very limited uh, since that period. So you see that golf courses that were um, constructed just before the crisis hit have remained largely undeveloped in the years since. These are a few examples of largely abandoned or undeveloped golf courses in Mexico. So we have seen so far that since the crisis of 2008, the golf, cons golf course constructions has plummeted uh, dramatically. It seems that while it used to power, it used to be a power as an amenity driving real estate development is widening. So this scenario imagines a new future for the golf course as an alternative type of ur urban green central to prime real estate developments. Uh, the scenario we have chosen to place it in Los Angeles, uh, in it's yeah in here okay, uh, as the a parks need assessments from LA underlies the necessity for more public parks in the metropolitan area. Los Angeles is one of the cities with more more golf courses per inhabitant. So uh, from here we have chosen two different scenarios where golf courses in various districts are reimagined as they open up for people and nature. So with the lo loss of memberships and the green fees on one hand and the other, in the other hand, the excessive maintenance on the other, we are aiming for, to, uh, for looking at new financial, financial models that, to explore, to create a network of viable democratic green space, uh, space across the city. Sorry. I don't know. Sorry. Okay, so the first scenario uh, we have uh, chosen to be a network for commercial production landscapes. Uh, within this network, we are connecting the, with the electric golf carts and organizing these golf, uh, uh, golf, golf courses with urban vineyards, fruit, orchards, vegetables, and gardens. The golf layout is utilized and implemented as an urban strategy for giving back to the community. The second scenario aims to give nature from up to Santa Monica's mountains an opportunity to connect with the city again. Here we are showing how some of the connections, uh, how the nature slowly takes over the urban uh, from, uh, from the urban ecosystem and starts to change. So as well, the golf course layout uh, starts slowly changing towards the post-bankers golf course. Well, so what it used to be an amenity for the real estate now is open to the public and nature and the city. Uh, so the next uh, condition we looked into uh, is uniqueness is equal to appeal. So the presumption on which most, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the presumption on which most projects are based is that uniqueness can create more value. We always propose new designs and fresh ideas, but is it the case? Paris, the city of love. Paris the idea of love replicated in China. Shakespeare village in UK, replicated in Thamestown, China, which is however now is a failed project with only a, which has become now a hot destination for pre-wedding photo shoot. The castle in Scotland was inspired, uh, has inspired the Disney uh, land Cinderella castle in California and was later adopted to uh, to, to Turkey, with, uh, but is now again another ghost town with 350 abandoned villages. Uh, so we see that copy and replicating has long been uh, used by developers as a marketing strategy. Why it attracts customers is because of their ability to provide an experience of what is not immediately available in their own country. 
Portofino is another small Italian town, which are in our research is found to be replicated in four different places around the world. The Porto uh, Merilino in North Wales, as far as Orlando in the Portofino Bay Hotel. And, but the most significant of its replica has been Lavasa, the first privately owned city in India built from scratch. The city, is spread across 100 square kilometer as compared to the tiny little 10 square kilometer Portofino. Lavasa was extremely uh, popular on its uh, launch and it was able to sell all its villas, which were like three, uh, 850 villas and 650 flats in just over a, day, uh, a duration of a day. What can be attributed to its strong branding and public pitches? is the replication formula that lures a European lifestyle in an ideal city away from the Indian realities. The town center, uh, which is also the ma main marketing image of Lavasa, is an exact reflection of Portofino. How an entire city was transported on a different piece of land remains uh, very fascinating. So is it about just picking a similar color palette. While we were looking into all these uh, different Portofinos spread across the world, there were similar, uh, like there are some features that are always adopted, like they're always positioned on a bay, they have a mountain behind, there is a certain way the windows are placed, the proportions of building, and a tower which keeps replicating in all its forms. But going further, and analyzing the points from where most pictures are taken, which become these tourist uh, way of uh, showing these cities, uh, an interesting analogy started appearing. So in the case of Portofino, these points are always located on the other side of the bay and also in middle of the water. Uh, the focus is always on a single image. For Port uh, and for Portofino, it is the cluster of these colorful buildings which are present on the other side of the town. In case of Lavasa, uh, yeah, here, uh, it is actually a single row of buildings which are colored here that create this effect. The city is also uh, like bifurcated into two parts, which is like the Portofino side on the right and the hill view side on the left. And that is also determined the way these streets are also named. So on the right is always the Portofino Street, the Tickets, Ticket Street, and on the left is the Hillview Street or the Valley View Street. Uh, the buildings on the front also show this paradoxical nature where uh, the facade that faces the front or this picture side has these colored uh, box windows. They omit the balcony, which is actually something very important to Indian developers because it gives the leverage of uh, more built space. Um, the buildings which are behind, which are here in black, uh, accommodates the bigger facilities like housing, hotels, convention centers, basically things that are large span, but are always like hidden behind this main facade. Lavasa was originally not as um, similar in its geography as Portofino, and it actually manicured it the way the water uh, is now, uh, as we see the water now. So how it did was by creating these embankments and these uh, um, water retention dikes, and so was the image uh, created. But however, Lavasa, like all other uh, copy town has again fell into this financial battle and is uh, facing problems with funding and will now soon be applying maybe for bankruptcy. Uh, initially designed to accommodate like these 3 million people and was expecting over 2 million uh, tourists, Portofino, um, 2 million tourists, while Portofino on the other hand has only 500 residents. It's a very a uh, small tourist destination, Portofino is sort of now frozen in time. The city, as any other historical city, is carefully conserved and preserved. But as all historical cities face these issues, uh, it has a stagnation in its growth. 
can it learn from Lavasa to form a fully functioning city? Is there anything, Portofino, uh, that can learn, that a copy can learn from the original? Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, the Mount of Portofino is actually a limestone hillock the geographical, con uh, the geographical condition it, uh, do not allow expansion. So instead of water, maybe Portofino can learn to alter its geography by artificially creating these reclaimed land. The town can further develop into uh, with different economic sectors and clusters and zones as was adopted in Lavasa, connected through uh, the uh, infrastructure corridor, uh, which will enable its growth. Uh, the geography thus can be utilized to create similar scenography across the area, learning from the methods of artificial dike and water retention. Utilizing the same form of existing building to accommodate functions that require larger span, like institution, convention centers, essential for the growth of a city. Planting important infrastructure like STPs or data networks and other buildings that can help Portofino grow, uh, but hiding them, uh, in hiding them to stay true to the original image and character of Portofino. So it is a common understanding that the more accessible the place is, the more its value. Accessibility is a key factor in real estate, but uh, what about islands? What about islands? Islands, by their nature, are difficult to reach as they have their own borders from the mainland. So how can it be that they cost more than the regular mainland? Maybe it's this exact idea that makes them viable, the idea of owning your own individual little country. How a closer look, this, it's obvious that there is more to that. Islands as a real estate has its own rules. Due to, like, to the lack of accessibility, it is a market that flourished when websites became a common tool for buying and reviewing. Buying an island has to do with various aspects. It's not about, but about the compilation of multiple characteristics that make them unique and contribute to its value. This case study aims to utilize information taken by the islands on Earth and discover the characteristics that make them so wanted. The islands of this case study are very different with each other, but they serve two common factors, that they are the most expensive and that they are all located in close proximity to the equator. Analyzing those 10 islands, the following characteristics came up as important and relevant to their value. Characteristics that vary from inherited geographical ones, like whether or not they are capable of accommodating an airstrip, the morphology of the terrain, the illusion of isolation, their natural fauna and flora, whether or not the island is part of a bigger cluster of islands, the proximity to the mainland, exceptional natural geological phenomena such as caves and lakes, whether or not they, are, they can accommodate water sports and other activities, and also some man-made contributions, resorts, airstrips, golf courses, and the road network. Discovering those uh, made this research a precise manual Analysis is employing also tools such as the section of the terrain and the horizon limit calculated from its highest and lowest viewing points. Having this comparative manual, one can use it to understand what contributes to the value of the island typology and also navigate through different choices to find what kind of island fits more to their needs. In this way, this catalog can be understood as a shopping guide. The island market can also be compared with the artwork market, where the piece is being appreciated using multiple factors, but, but most importantly, personal taste. It is also possible to utilize this knowledge in another way around. 
having as a starting point the result of this research, namely the found characteristics. If we could find or transplant those characteristics in other parts of the Earth, then those locations would have the potential of becoming viable if offered in market. Could this be a rescue scheme? Greece has a debt, but also has islands. In this extreme, outrageous, and ethically challenged scenario, the country has to cut and sell part of its body. Nearly 100 of the almost 600 registered islands that belong to the Greek government would be part of a national rescue scheme. The islands that qualify according to the standards found above would be offered to the international market, increasing that way the value of Greece's national assets. Increasing the value of its islands means decreasing the depth of the, of the debt. Through a collaboration between the Greek government, the ministries of tourism as well and tourism and uh, culture as well as private companies, these islands would be offered for sale or lease. An expo would launch this experiment. In this islandscape expo, developers and investors would gather and get familiar with the offered locations. Like the base research, the islands would be displayed for the public in this exhibition, accompanied also by a catalog that, could, that would explain graphically all the global and local attributes of its island. The expo would have sections for more specific kinds of islands, such as islands featuring water sports, island nature, or even islands featuring local heritage. Okay, thank you, Marianti, uh, and thanks all for your um, uh, deeply researched and um, provoking um, reflections. Uh, we'd like now to actually pass to the second uh, part of this evening's session, uh, where we open up to a discussion uh, with our invited guests, but also um, with the authors of the projects at hand. So, uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Uh, I would like to open this discussion by referring actually to the first and the last projects. Uh, we can actually, if we look at, at these two projects, uh, the, the uh, first one is trying to um, mobilize uh, the facades uh, of a building uh, in order to free, to liberate its floor area. It, it basically uses uh, the facades to um, bring revenue. And then by freeing the floor space, uh, it enables, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to accommodate uh, uses that otherwise probably would have not uh, uh, taken place in that uh, area because of the price of property. Then the second uh, project, uh, as we have just seen, it's a form of trade-off of resources uh, as a plan of uh, rescue for the national economies. And I would like to ask you, what is your position? Or I would like to invite you to comment upon these types of Faustian uh, uh, bargain. And uh, perhaps, uh, Patrice, would you like to, to start? Thank you very much. And uh, once again, sorry, a little uh, time delay here in, in New York, uh, but um, excellent um, presentations, great thinking. I mean, really sort of breaking through a lot of pre-established concepts, uh, which are concepts that limit not just architecture, but also real estate developers, financiers, the expectation of users right? The expectation of people who actually use and buy and uh, participate in these buildings. Uh, so, you know, uh, credit across everyone. Um, let's uh, just start with these two first projects. Uh, taking the building as billboard uh, the, uh, and the Times Square project. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's fascinating to see how much we we typically think of real estate as just horizontal square footage. Real estate is firstly cubic, right? 
And then very importantly, a big component of it is the, what I call the intersection with the rest of the world, right? And that is the facade that is the way in which it accommodates a public space, public use, and so on. Uh, so here, you know, you're being very explicit about that uh, that feature, uh, but it is it is only one of the it is only one feature. But I'm pleased you've really highlighted it uh, because all too often it's discounted as an important aspect of the valuation of real estate and the understanding of real estate. You've taken an extreme situation where it is used, you could actually rent it by the square foot of facade as advertising, but really what it typically does just as a facade is advertise the building, advertise the use, advertise the users and occupants. It advertises the place of this building and this function and this activity in the building within the larger context. And, you know, so, so I think that, you know, we often just think of a facade as, yes, that's, you know, that's the way we're going to uh, articulate the sort of external uh, skin. But in fact, seeing it as this, uh, not just symbolism, but also very economic projection of what the building is about or could be about or even isn't about. It's a projection of something. So I thought, you know, I thought that was very good. Um, and, you know, uh, I think the what comes out of that is the benefit that you can say some build, some parts of our built environment, the vertical, the vertical planes are going to play different roles to that of the horizontal planes. And we start to need to think about breaking those apart in how we construct and design buildings. Um, so that was very good. Just a, a little thing about, you know, uh, I, love, I, I mean, I, 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 I hate to think what the Parisians would think of, um, of the proposed plan. Uh, you know, I, I think it'd be a nice little temporary thing I could see uh, I could see it um, as you know something that uh, comes for a for an expression of time and moment and so on. But I doubt the Parisians would embrace it permanently. But well, uh, I mean, you can argue that even the, the Eiffel Tower was supposed to be a permanent structure. It was supposed to be temporary, right? Mm. But this is the exact intention to be as provocative as, as we would like to be, no? I, exactly. But one thing I can one thing I can suggest is though, when you go to visit Times Square, are there any others? It was it was hard to we were actually scouting for a place that it was uh, that memorable. We exactly. we did find like some example of like very expensive billboard, uh, like a sellable or rented area, like uh, what is it, a circus. In uh, in London, Circus uh, yes. Square or something. Circus, that's right, Piccadilly Circus and so yeah, on. Piccadilly Circus and uh, some uh, few examples in Spain and Dubai, but uh, yeah. not really exactly like like we found in in, in Times Square. All so, right. So, what is it about the urban activity, urban environment of Times Square that are, and Piccadilly Circus actually is also one. Trafalgar Square is another. What is mm -hmm. it about that people? Uh, walking, staying in place, and so on. So, you know, an important thing about Times Square is that you don't just have these flashing signs as people go past. You've got to, you've got to create a whole context. So it's uniqueness, it's how people act, and so on. But very good at picking up the fact that, you know, it is about the people being there and being in a context called Times Square. Therefore, an advertiser wants to be there as well. You've yeah. got to have the people there first. Then real estate is, a, you know, it's, it's it, real estate is like an insidious sort of leech because it gets onto something, you know, there's people here. So now I'm going to benefit from that and I'm going to make more of it and so on and more of it and more of it. And it creates Times Square, but there's a limit, right? And if you tried to do it, if you tried to replicate it with 10 of them, you wouldn't have the value, right? The yeah. value would plummet. So 
but very good. I thought, you know, that that sort of whole whole notion. Uh, just make sure you bring the people activity back into it. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll talk about it more as we go through other projects as well. But that real estate value is use. Yeah. Right? It's use. And use yeah. has a whole variety of dimensions, which we will come up during our discussion. And and I think that that's what, that was one of the driven forces that uh, drove us as well to pick uh, Paris as the as the example to for the for the speculation. Very good, very good. Uh, Paul, what what do you think? Would you see this model being exported to other cities? Would you see it, for instance, in Amsterdam? Well, as I was listening to the conversation, I just thought that there was a lot of parallels with Proposition Number Seven which is the issue of uniqueness. And I think that mm. already kind of mentioned that uh, Times Square is pretty unique as a context. Mm -hmm. uh, that's maybe if you transport it to Paris and then replicate it so many places across Paris, it probably loses its value. So I think that is uh, uh, potentially quite interesting. Um, I really like the idea of uh, the real estate value is in the use. But then it got me thinking uh, in a lot of the examples, the users were people with power. So we talk about golf courses, we talk about these, uh, these symbolic uh, buildings uh, owned by financial institutions. Uh, and I'm just also wondering whether or not we ought to broaden the discussion on the uh, asset class and economics as a means of maybe distribution rather than just about wealth uh, generation. So I, I really like the idea that uh, we need to look at facades and its interaction with public space. Uh, I get a sense that we are kind of losing the publicness uh, 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 in this conversation. So maybe I just end there uh, for now. Amy, uh, what would you comment? Do you do you actually see this kind of Faustian bargain work as an urban strategy? <laughs> well, I think it is working. It's constantly working right, over and over again. And that's, that's what you showed. I mean, I think in general, what I liked about all of the projects was taking this sort of proposition that when we live in a kind of moment when seemingly Kind of imaginary financial assets that are determining the very real fates of people's lives you know these kind of imaginary concepts are having very very real effects and the whole idea of kind of fictitious capital you know something that is driven by land values that actually um has this real power and what i liked about the projects generally is that there was an acceptance that fictitious capital and these kind of imaginary concept concepts have very, very tangible effects and that they have real power. And, and so it's sort of taking, taking this as a very real thing and then saying, okay, if we take the fictions to be real and capitalize on those fictions, what do we then get? And you start to play with sort of the ethics, if you like, of corporate real estate by turning things on their head. And, you know, it made me think about this term financialization where you see the kind of bleeding of financial concepts and metaphors and narratives um, into society and culture. Um, and I think the metaphor came through very strongly in uh, both of these cases. And I, you know, particularly when we think about the facade, the facade is all about metaphor. It has a meaning that changes over time. Um, it embodies these kind of, uh, these, these uh, concepts like speculate, grow, develop, these are all embodied within the facades. And I think um, what P Patrice said about, you know, facades don't just have a kind of aesthetic value, but they actually are embedded with the economic logic of real estate. I find that to be really, really interesting. And if you kind of go back historically, you can see it physically on facades. I mean, if we think about modernist buildings, for example, they don't have um, a facade in the truest sense, or at least in the way that we traditionally thought about facades as communicating meaning. But actually they communicate other kinds of economic logic. For example, prefabricated modular components that, can be, that are rolled out en masse and then um, you know, used to construct um, places of extremely high value based on this kind of logic of grid-like calculations. So I think generally speaking, I, I thought this was a kind of really interesting perspective. Um, 
one thing I I think is maybe worth thinking about a little more, a little bit more depth is how um, you know we, we think about these uh, facades, for example, the kind of billboard, the flashy billboard facade. Um, I mean, sorry, just going back to what um, Paul said about Times Square being unique. What I think is really interesting about the uniqueness of Times Square is that it's driven by something that's entirely not unique. It's these kind of um, images that we see circulated everywhere, all over the world. Um, and what I was wondering when I was kind of looking at these projects is how, how the systems at play are really challenged through the projects. So, um, you know, we, you know, we think about ownership as being something that's very complex and distributed, as you said, but responsibility is also very complex and distributed. So the way these buildings are constructed and the way that real estate becomes a leech is by certain policies, financial frameworks, regulations, these kinds of laws that are put into place. Um, so I, with this Faustian pact, I think we have to think about a much bigger kind of systemic uh, issue. So how can thinking this way in terms of kind of fictions enable us to reshape or challenge the political or structural systems in place? I think it's interesting that you mentioned that, Amy, I'm wondering if, for example, um, either um, Felipe or Marianti, who worked on the islands, um, when you talk about these kind of issues, uh, Amy, that makes me think about the issues related to um, the, the sovereignty of national territory, which mm -hmm. could in certain cases be seen as a trading uh, value or a value to be traded. I'm curious also, Marianti, for example, what do you, what do you think about uh, these dimensions? Yeah, I mean, in my scenario, I really try to overcome my, my emotions because it's not about me, market's not about me, so, what I did is actually think as an investor, as a developer, and you know, uh, propose a scenario that is outrageous. And yeah, um, I mean, in a way, for now, for, for example, Greece is not, you cannot buy nothing from Greece, you can only, only lease, but um, employing all this knowledge into and trying to, to kind of applicate it in a scenario, that that parameter that they only lease could could also say. So the thing is that yeah, I mean this exercise was all about you know overcoming our ethics, overcoming our emotions, and see how things could work, could really work in real life, and you know being able to being able to to this is. We lost you on the last little bit right there, Marianne. Yeah, kind of um, recognize practices of the market. Mm -hmm. you know, they're clear sometimes, sometimes they're more clear, sometimes they're more abstract. But yeah, that was an exercise to, for us to be able to recognize them and, and, and point them and, you know, um, you know, understand them. I think, um, Amy, your comment as well on uh, the employment of the fictionalizations um, that are used in real estate and in the marketing of projects. I think that also nicely dovetails with some of the dimensions which you can find in, uh, in some of the other projects, such as the investigation into uh, Bosco Verticale and um, the dimensions of crowdfunding uh, in architecture. Uh, particularly uh, as these projects touch on, um, uh, say, notions such as uh, community or placemaking, sustainability, which initially were uh, very doe-eyed and, um, let's say, hopeful uh, vehicles for, um, let's say, resisting um, the system, quote-unquote, but uh, which we see also increasingly being used um, in boardrooms and by investors. Um, I, so I'm wondering, for example, Paul, if maybe you have a reflection on what's the relevance on these kind of notions of community um, in the context where they've been used for uh, reasons that are perhaps completely not um, or anti-community in reality. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of also struck by the uh, crowdfunding example. Uh, and I learned something today about the Statue of Liberty. So thank you for 
digging yeah. this out. But I was just wondering that nowadays with crowdfunding, um, uh, so first of all, through these digital platforms, uh, we, I think we open ourselves up to also um, uh, maybe getting funds from outside the local community. So I, I remember some studies uh, done in uh, the US where they were looking at the crowdfunding of, let's say, a bicycle um, uh, infrastructure, huh? uh, uh, riding infrastructure, and they realized that actually the people who are giving these funds are not necessarily from the local community per se, but actually from the next town uh, that actually benefits more from the uh, from the cycling uh, infrastructure. So I guess there is the question there of how do we kind of control uh, where the boundaries lie in terms of who has a voice uh, uh, um, um, in, in the design of that, that building. But I would also like the idea that uh, you, can, uh, you can sort of crowdfund a building and then build it in stages. Mm. Uh, I think that looks quite good in uh, simulation, uh, but I'm just wondering to what extent uh, that uh, can be translated in uh, practice, let's say. Huh? So, mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering also structurally, I think there needs to be a certain limit in uh, uh, planning. Uh, is there a kind of uh, base uh, level, and then you know what is the kind of limit? Uh, I think I think that's something to kind of think about. Um, but yeah, so this local community, uh, I had a project uh, before I moved to the Netherlands uh, in the UK. I was working with um, nuclear decommissioning, uh, and what I saw in that particular project was this idea of social value. When we start to uh, think about getting rid of these, so. Here we see a lot of projects, which is about kind of uh, creating these new assets. Huh? Uh, but it was also at the end of life, we need to think about what's uh, going to kind of happen uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the structures and so on. And there was one project, uh, which is a nuclear reactor. And it's really interesting because we often hear of nuclear energy as uh, 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 full of contention. So communities are afraid of its safety and so on. But actually what we found in this particular community was that they really wanted to keep the nuclear reactor because it reminded them of the industrial legacy, the nuclear legacy. Uh, and, and then of course, the people with power in the planning process uh, was kind of against uh, that idea of keeping this uh, monstrosity of a structure. Uh, and so what we saw there is also the tension between those who had the power in making decisions versus actually what the local community wanted. So uh, there, I think, uh, uh, it's open up to a lot, a lot of this fictionalization. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Santiago and, uh, and Howard, do you have any thoughts perhaps on how you could extend or um, um, further envision um, a flexible and phased crowdfunded project uh, such as what you were starting to look at? Uh, yes, actually coming back to what Paul was saying about uh, who takes the decisions in this project. That's very interesting because, of course, the more people that invest, uh, yeah, like more people will take part in the decisions of the project, right? But what was interesting is that when, while we were doing the research with how uh, we emailed some of these websites and these companies and we pretend we were investors, <laughs> so we were asking for information. And we asked uh, a couple of times about like what role, like what uh, are the limits or like what, uh, what kind of decisions could I as an investor take? And always the answer was like, none. like you don't, you don't participate at all in the design process of the, of the, of the building. So in a way it's like, uh, it's, a, it's a design that is, um, yeah, like static in a way, like it, it isn't shrinking or, ex yeah, like, or extending as the, as the money does so yeah i think it's very important to take into account that of course the structural part of building in stages is really important because of course if you have a skyscraper and you have even more money to build on top yeah there is a point that the structural yeah like capacity or like of the columns or beams yeah it, it just takes to the to do its limits in a way i think you pointed out something quite interesting which is the sort of irony of a word like crowdfunding where uh, while indeed um, a whole bunch of people are contributing small amounts of money, um, the decision making perhaps um, and the the way that the project actually gets implemented is anything but. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah. Sorry, Patrice, yes. go on. May I add? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we, if we, I'm, I'm always keen to offer to expose these things for our architects, right? When I see them, and you know, just while a couple of words on on crowdfunding because it sounds so democratic, and Rodriguez Nino. Um, I don't know if you knew Rodrigo, but I knew him. He passed away just very recently, very sadly. But he really proposed it as being a democratic participation. Mm -hmm. right? So democratic participation, but in the financial returns. And therefore, you had to succeed authority to someone who was making the decisions to achieve the financial returns. So crowdfunding is very, very different from community funding and uh you know i and in fact i think we should forget about funding there's so much one thing about capitalism is it's given us the money tap right the money is out there to be tapped and what we need to do is really work out value creation we as architects and that's a, and you know that's much more about use not just that's about use and decisions and what purpose the building will have and who will you know who will occupy it and so on and not just about that crowdfunding and another problem with the proposal although i thought it was i thought it was really great that san diego was you know saying this thing could go on forever an important thing about real estate is there are two things one is return on investments that's the 12 percent a year although it, you couldn't get that really but uh that's a bit high but the return of capital. So the project has to finish at some point and be crystallized in monetary terms. It can't just go on building. So just a couple of, you know, red flags about red crowdfunding. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Always the teacher, sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder perhaps if, uh, if Rainier, you had any thoughts also on the, um, um, the terminologies used uh, today very often. Um, we looked at um, a very a decidedly very green project, um, which we uh, saw uh, through the quite exhaustive research done by the students uh, is perhaps in many ways anything but. Um, but also again, these words, crowdfunding community. Um, and uh, I'm curious, what are your reflections on the, um, the position of such terminology? Uh, well, <clears throat> I, think that I mean the if you look at the effort not of the individual project uh, uh, projects but uh, as an effort of the studio as a whole it is of course was very much aimed at unsettling certain given truths at, at, at you know default assumptions uh, uh, and and I think if you ask me about terms uh, I think that attitude extends towards almost uh, all terms used, also all terms used in the context of this uh, uh, discussion. I think every term, particularly terms which have a particular moral uh, imperative that you uh, almost feel guilty if you don't necessarily endorse the term 200%, particularly those are very vicious uh, terms. I think the term community, uh, for me, it's 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 interesting that that is something which was used by radically progressive architects of uh, Team Ten, and then a decade later, it was equally fanatically embraced by the uh, far more reactionary new urbanists, uh, who uh, you know erred on the other side of the political spectrum, uh, and and used the words with the same degree of enthusiasm. And I think that's the many terms are, are have two sides of a medal. I actually think that also applies to use, uh, because not by chance did uh, I show a vast majority of examples uh, of architecture which is owned, but largely left unused. Uh, and, and in that sense, you could say, you know, if a building isn't used, it's a failure, which maybe it is, but in economic terms, those unused empty buildings uh, are, are a phenomenal success. And I think that therefore the success in economic terms tends to, well, or, or, or can in some instances move so far away from the use of value is, is a very uh, uh, 
alarming uh, thing, uh, perhaps, but even there, I wonder if through some kind of judo or to some kind of manipulative twist that essentially, and that underlies the whole project a little bit, that through some kind of manipulative coup de théâtre, you can turn uh, in themselves not necessarily beneficial trends onto themselves to distill some sort of productive uh, uh, strategy out of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder perhaps maybe if Paul or if Amy, you have any thoughts on this, on um, the role of use in, uh, in this paradigm where even use itself um, can be conjured into an alibi, uh, potentially. Yeah, well, I think um, what's interesting is actually, if you look at the language of real estate since the 1980s, maybe slightly earlier in very, very marginal parts, that's sort of avant-garde, I suppose. Um, you can see that use is, is used um, as a creator of value. So it's a kind of, it's, it became a kind of buzzword, if you like. Um, and this was, you know, the idea that um, the market was shifting from being something where you could simply provide floor space and that that would automatically give value to actually realizing that it was more about providing kind of qualitative space. So space that had specific kinds of qualities associated with specific kinds of work um, and much more kind of tailored to individual needs and preferences. Um, and you know, what's interesting is there were practices like DEGW, for example, mm. who really took this very seriously and did very, very deep levels of research according to different sectors, different clients. Um, but then the term became a kind of blanket term, if you like, for having done a, a vague bit of sectoral statistical research and then producing certain kinds of buildings that were appropriate for certain kinds of uses. So it became a kind of very thin veil, if you like, mm -hmm. um, certainly in the kind of uh, 90s for, um, yeah, for, so the, the whole idea that exchange value was somehow replaced by use value was somehow actually kind of very superficial concept. Um, so I think use is, uh, use is a word that's also used to sort of capitalize on, I suppose. Um, but I think what um, is interesting is that you can, if you think about use as being an important condition for real estate it kind of transforms the way you think about architectural practice so whereas architects and practices by by necessity often only consider the life of their buildings up to the point of construction if you think about use then you uh, you naturally have to have a relationship with the building beyond the point of construction it has to be something that's kind of co constantly changing and adapting to the use context um, and that is interesting because yeah, it, it fundamentally repositions the architectural profession as being more than simply kind of a provider of design to actually um, a kind of sector that works with people and clients kind of on a, on a longer term basis. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, have a, a, I have an interesting anecdote uh, <laughs> on that respect. I mean, um, of course, the value of buildings are related to use, but often the most valuable buildings are those that change use over time a number of times. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a very ambiguous relation. Uh, the anecdote I have uh, as an architect is that we recently completed a hotel uh, in Amsterdam uh, near the Rai, and Corona uh, broke out, etc. The poor hotel had about a 5% occupancy rate. Um, so, uh, and we were done, our job was done, the building was finished, etc. So as a, as a sort of an architect with a vaguely societal con uh, conscience, I reached out to the hotel since there was a hospital uh, next door, the Fumedi Centrum, etc, etc. And um, uh, in a way suggested that they doubled as a Corona uh, hospital. Since there was a shortage of beds, there was a shortage of room, and in a way, a perfect hotel with compartmented rooms, also uh, uh, well provided, perhaps for an interesting temporary hospital, uh, which I think would make a lot of sense. And the hospital was interested. Uh, the municipality caught wind of it, uh, and 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 wanted to do something with it. But then you run into a kind of an enormous. 
actually very disintangible wall whereby apparently uh, for the hotel owner, it is more lucrative and profitable to keep their hotel nearly completely empty than to engage in, uh, in such an initiative, which I think had it not made the money, it had earned the massive PR value. Mm. And yet, uh, so I think there are a number of, I, I guess, interesting systemic failures part of the system that even prevent the most obvious uses to take their natural uh, conclusion. You know, and I haven't gone to the end of that. If I just make a very quick point, I think this issue of uh, youth, um, I would also, I, I really like the word uh, productive. And I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what kinds of buildings are we kind of creating? Uh, and I was really struck right at the beginning of this session uh, when Rene uh, showed us the graph and, you know, that it's all about residential and uh, uh, speculative uh, housing, I think that uh, got us into trouble. Um, and, and I don't think that's necessarily productive capital. And, and I think it just kind of reinforces the kind of economic system that, that kind of sucks us up into it, I, I guess. Uh, so, so then maybe we need to start uh, moving away from this uh, idea of uh, uh, use value to actually figure out how productive are we uh, uh, kind of sustaining uh, uh, society, I guess. Um, the other thing also I hear in the conversations is that we need to think about how our designs, uh, how the use is changing. Um, I'm also just wondering whether the value also lies in uh, timeless designs, uh, because you know we, we constantly change uh, so much that maybe we perhaps lose the value of those those timeless designs and maybe there is something there to kind of learn from history. Maybe here it would be interesting actually to move on this um, um, other topic of um, original and replicas because um, we have seen in, in the project uh, of uh, Shaivanti that there can be a, an interesting um, symbiosis uh, between uh, the original and and the copy and yeah I think I would invite you to comment uh, upon this idea of replication and and uh, ultimately uh, asking the question whether there is something to learn from uh, examples like Lavasa. Um, well, maybe. I. I yeah. love the I love the topic because I think it's just so uncomfortably honest, hmm. you know, that we are actually constantly surrounded by replicas. They may not be as obvious as this, but they are everywhere. You know, every every city you go to has a mass of similar buildings. And the whole concept of a kind of aura of an original is so defunct in our current kind of globalized globalized system. But this but I love this is because it's a kind of extravaganza of um of sort of uh, pastiche, if you like. Um, there's a, it reminded me of this really nice film I saw last year by Benoit Felici called The Real Thing. I don't know if anybody saw that. It was at the Rotterdam Architecture Film Festival. And this was an exploration of several of these places across the world um, where local governments have, sp have invested huge amounts of money to have a kind of miniature Eiffel Tower or something like that. And what the film shows in a, in a really kind of actually very moving way is that these things that we initially want to laugh at actually have very real meaning for the people that live and work there and create, um, you know, that the people who worked within these spaces um, took real pride in these landmarks. Um, and that in a way, they have a kind of funny way of creating their own communities. Um, which I, I found kind of really fascinating, but they're also their own kind of labor pool. Um, and that's also something not to be sniffed at, right? That the kind of creation of work for people also kind of creates a certain kind of meaning. I think um, sort of thinking also of this in relation to uh, the second project about the kind of duck buildings um, and the, the facades, the, um, I was, I'm, I'm also sort of struck at, again, kind of the, the facade comes back as a really prominent element, you know, as a kind of carrier of meaning um, in a kind of very superficial way. 
Um, and I liked the way that um, with the Lavasa City you kind of threw that on its head and kind of shifted it by trying to find other value in it. Um, but I, what I think is interesting about facades is that they have this kind of separation, if you like, from, from what's often what's going on inside the building, that they have their own kind of temporality as well in contemporary buildings, like the way that they actually can be completely taken away and re and put back on. Um, so they, they have their own, they actually kind of have their own economic value in relation to the rest of the building. Um, so yeah, I, I just really enjoyed the way that this kind of challenged the, the primacy of the original. But I wonder um, if any real uh, real estate developer is truly that concerned about originality um, in the current context or not. I, may I step in? I'd like to sort yes, of you know, shout out for replicas and reproductions and references and representations. And, uh, you know, I, so I don't think it's really all that too modern. I think we've been, you know, building uh, things uh, thousands of years, centuries to look like, you know, the, let's face it, the Roman temples were marble imitations of the wood or timber Greek ones, right? So, you know, I think that, you know, even down to the fluting, uh, I think that uh, it, it's, it, there's a place for those who create an original object that has, uh, that inspires a new view or a new, uh, a new sense of something uh, that takes its place within us and our visual, our constant visual references. We need them for security. We need them to negotiate. We need them to know our place, you know, in the society and where we are. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's like fiction. That's why we have fiction and we don't all read nonfiction. You know, we, we need to explore through referencing and pushing and, and, and placing uh, different fictions, different, uh, different things amongst us. And, and I agree with you, Amy, in that it's, you know, often it's temporal. You know, these things have, they, they aren't forever. And that's an important thing for architects to remember that they are really creating something that has a life due to the receptivity of the people around it and within it and, and so on. And, you know, we can get back to use again because use is much more than just the functional use, but also the symbolic use for mm. the community and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, so I think this is, you know, this is fine. I think we need representations. We need reusing of representations. Um, you know, where, but then we've got to say, is there a limit? And, and I think perhaps there are, there are two limits from a very pragmatic point of view as a real estate person. There's a limit in where it becomes no longer meaningful and no longer unique and no longer compelling. So that's, you know, that's something that I make sure real estate people really think through. Just as you, Amy, said about DGW do their functional uh, investigation, you know, thinking about doing an investigation about the real potent meaning of representations and facades and so on uh, is important. So, you know, that's a pragmatic thing. You know, what is its real value? Is that value diminishing uh, because of social changes and mores? And, and, but the second thing is deceit, you know, at the same time we're a community and we as architects are create or real estate people are creating things within a community. And though we want to represent something, we, we don't, we should have our own moral compass about deceiving. So, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Paul, I, I wanted to ask in relation to this, do you, if you look at life cycle of buildings, could we talk about a, a, a life cycle of uniqueness? Could we talk about maybe, uh, I don't know, a building or a city in the case of uh, Portofino, for example, that uh, reaches a sort of terminus point of its uh, usability and uh, to the point that, yeah, it's stuck in a perpetual tourist uh, industry and then maybe, yeah, somehow it, it just becomes a model for other um, other developments. So if I maybe respond to that with maybe two points. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, I think uh, I just want to echo the point that Amy made a while ago that 
value is not just in the quantitative measure, but it's mm. also qualitative, uh, qualitative value. Uh, so what I would say is that uh, at least nowadays, we are really interested in measuring the social value uh, of the kind of uh, the built asset, but it's not just uh, the social value at a point in time, but how it changes throughout the life cycle. Huh? So, mm -hmm. so we are always having to track. And I think nowadays there's quite a lot of uh, interest in tracking that. Uh, but I want to maybe also make another point about replicas. Uh, so mm. apart from replicas being uh, a new way of reinterpreting the original, I would also say trying to reproduce the replica is often not so straightforward. So if you kind of think about the craftsmanship that has to go into creating uh, a replica that is close enough to the original, and here I can think of a particular context, which is uh, there are parallels there, and that's in heritage buildings. Uh, so for instance, I, uh, I come from Singapore originally, uh, and uh, in Singapore, there's now a kind of uh, drive towards trying to preserve the old uh, heritage buildings. And then they have to kind of recreate the original. Mm -hmm. But they haven't got the workers to do that because most of the workers are migrant workers, right? So they actually learn about the techniques and the reproduction of uh, the, the, the original. And then they go back to their countries in Bangladesh and, uh, uh, you know, in, in Myanmar and so on. And they've got these techniques now that they also then transport. So what I would uh, also say is that the value is, uh, while we talk about the local communities, the value is also pretty much, uh, it crosses uh, geographic yeah. boundaries. I think that's yeah. really interesting. I think that's a really interesting point that also echoes a bit what Patrice was just saying, um, that essentially there, there is no original uh, when it comes down to it. Everything has been a copy of something else uh, in a certain sense. Um, and so in that sense, it's kind of permanent and an underlying condition. Um, I wanted to skip to the last round of questions because I'm quite aware of time. I'm not sure also if Solomon uh, will let us continue uh, a little bit after the hour, but uh, maybe he will if we address the next question to him, um, uh, where we had uh, two projects which deal with um, phenomenon such as loopholes and let's say legal lacunas to create uh, zones of exception where the alibi of a uh, game of golf, for example, or the, um, um, the designation of a light uh, structure such as a mobile home um, indeed uh, provides for unexpected opportunities of inhabitation. Uh, but also more generally, uh, as a reflection on the general studio, the notion that um, the phenomenon that we witness, which happened outside of the discipline of architecture, uh, seem to offer a kind of um, completely limitless, limitless source of creativity, which perhaps surpasses even the creativity of architects themselves. So uh, I think as a general question, uh, is there something that we can learn from these projects uh, as architects? Can we use this sort of um, the venom, if you will, uh, which we witness uh, as part of an eventual antidote for a sort of common good? Um, you're directing this towards me. Yes, um, you start. Yeah, maybe a kind of just, well, speaking of terms, just in my pedanticism, I'm just a kind reminder that this was a seminar, not a studio, speaking of terms. Um, uh, <laughs> but then, you know, so, but I'm sorry about, I'm sorry about no, no, that. No, 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 no. But I basically, I say that because in sense, it was a kind of theory seminar, right? So basically the idea etymologically of theory, basically being a calibration of how you set a lens, let's put it this way, to ask a set of questions. So, I mean, I, I don't say that to be pedantic or disrespectful, but more, I think in a way, all these speculations are, I would say, pieces of theory, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. uh, in that one sense. Um, and then in that sense, I think, I mean, the kind of cliches of are these projects of venomous, et cetera. I mean, I think it's, I think the most important thing is to always kind of be up. Architecture is inherently a speculative or projective act. And it would be that the lens within which to view something should always have a sort of optimism and positivity and to, and to find uh, potential and possibilities within given connections. Or, um, and that is basically how you uh, make a project, a speculation. That's how you break 
the dominant systems. I mean, because I think it's very important not to fall into the trap of um, cliches or cynicism, but to look for possibilities, to look for the extraordinary within the ordinary and things of that sort. I mean, I guess that's what I would like to contribute to that discussion. And I think um, all these, uh, let's say, um, yes, yeah, speculations, I think do that in their, uh, uh, each in their own kind of unique way. So, you know, rather that's called finding a loophole or being optimistic, <laughs> you know, that's, that's also in whatever term one chooses to use. But I think in that sense, there's something that um, it's important. Well, I think for all the students as uh, all architects, you know, there's one foot in the door in uh, let's say practice and one foot in the door of let's say theory. And I appreciate how these projects, which is the aim of a bear like a post-master education, everybody comes in already as a trained architect to basically question the own, the tools of the reality within which they engage. And I believe that this uh, starts to do that so mm -hmm. yeah, I guess that's all I have to say. I hope that's right. cool. maybe, I'm curious if, uh, oh, sorry, Ludo, go ahead. No, I, I'd like to actually maybe add to that, that maybe to pose a question to, to the three of you as a teaching team to, uh, I think I remember us being in your office a year ago, uh, you proposing the idea of the, the asset class. And to me, that was then a very interesting proposal as if you look at the idea of the balance sheet, where you have on the left hand, you have the assets, and on the right hand, you have the legibilities, and that you kind of, so one, one hand is kind of property and buildings, and the other hand is kind of finance in a way. And I think it was very interesting that you then proposed to really look at assets as a kind of, as a territory of the architect. And so my question now to you would be, do you think after seeing this project, do you think the assets uh, that's where the kind of success or where indeed the kind of the agency of the architect is or is it actually also more on the right side of the balance sheet where kind of the finance happens or are these two so much intertwined that you cannot talk only about assets but that you always have to talk about the two of them Um, if I may, you mean the, let's say the relation between the potential benefit of a project and it's, um, it's, well, it's downside in a sense. Let's say the financial structures behind it. If you say that a, a building uh, increases in value at 200% in one year time, maybe that kind of value increases not in either the land or the building itself, but actually in the kind of financial structures, the derivatives, all these kind of the, the financing structures behind it. So my question mm -hmm. just being, um separating these two things in a way what you try to do in this class how do you reflect upon that yeah i i think in the end it's not possible to separate them no and i think what perhaps one of the the, the intentions of this class is or what has ended up happening through the class has been uh, revealing how um, things are not necessarily what they seem uh, even when they seem to be uh, the most let's say positive in, in ways that you can described through um, you know marketing language or uh, images which sell a certain story of a project i think it it um, it creates a certain awareness of the fact that those financial logics are, are present in any case you know underneath uh, in the sense that um, they're inextricable and they're part of the motive uh, why a project happens and i think also perhaps why i was asking this question at the end was that uh, what we saw through the speculative scenario was attempts to perhaps not be distant from the potential, let's say, repugnance of uh, some of the phenomena, um, to not look at them, let's say, morally as being uh, perhaps bad or being uh, unethical, um, but looking at what roles could they have, which could actually turn the kind of the initial, let's say, morally dubious um, aspects into something positive um, with perhaps a slight hunch that not doing that actually then unwittingly makes you as an architect uh, complicit anyway yeah. in in the act yeah i i don't know but, but ludo i'm not sure i understand the question are you asking if we think the stu the, the sorry what is called a seminar was a success well, I'm mainly asking if you're, you're so, kind of focused on that left, on the left side of the balance sheet, the assets, rather than maybe the financial structures on the other side, 
whether well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's simply the fact that the buildings have an economic life uh, beyond what they cost, beyond what we as architects uh, uh, control in the form of budgets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I, I don't think, in my experience, uh, also as a practicing architect, that doesn't really register very firmly uh, in, in the profession of architecture. And I simply am of the opinion that it's better to know more than it is to know less. And, and I, I think that the more you know, the more effective or impactful uh, you will become also as an architect, even if what you find out isn't necessarily all good. And I like very much the fact that uh, Salomon uh, talks about optimism and loopholes also uh, to the point that optimism is maybe only possible if you find the loopholes in, uh, <laughs> in an essentially pessimistic uh, world. But maybe that is uh, what we've tried to do in a way, bang our head against a certain ceiling or a certain wall, if you talk about left and right, until you find an opening and a crack and a hole uh, whereby certain negatives become positive and i also think i like very much the discussion about copy and originals uh, and that maybe in architecture there are no originals architecture is ultimately an art of copying and slight mutations in the copying maybe that is architecture even modern architecture is very much based on on repetition and since uh, you know industrialization entered the building process that's only gotten worse nevertheless the more that becomes a reality, the more we fetishize the original uh, and, and so forth and so forth. So I'm not sure if we have found loopholes or whether we have we try to make something visible that is the case anyway, but everybody is in denial of. And, and I do think that, you know, uh, the solution to any problem uh, comes from recognizing, it requires recognizing the problem in the first place. So I guess that's what that's what we've done. And I, I like that we are a seminar and not a studio, because yeah. that makes me significantly more relaxed about some of the propositions I've seen today. <laughs> I think maybe the work of, of this uh, seminar uh, can be best described as hacking. Uh, it's a sort of attempt to to understand uh, the system and, and find a way to hack it. It's just modest attempts, but uh, it's it's, it's not about being delusioned uh, in a sort of conflict between practice and, and uh, school or academia. It's, it's, it's about bringing the creativity that, and liberty that you have uh, while studying to uh, mobilize it to overcome um, what would later be con considered as constraints in practice. Could I just add, um, Hans, if it's okay, can I add for Ludo, provide a little, um, a little place of, of where the optimism is located? Uh, and <laughs> looking at the balance sheet, yes, there are assets and there are liabilities, but on the, on the liability, just under liabilities is also equity, okay? So really, in fact, the proposition, the financial proposition is that the liabilities plus the equity should equal the value of the asset. Okay, so where you get to play is in that equity. That is where you provide the additional value in the asset that's over and above just the pure funding that has made obligations to create a building, right? So if the funding, the liabilities have been proscribed to create a certain thing, a certain use, a certain uh, financial value, and so on. What is possible is something beyond that. That's what developers often call profit, right? But I like to see it as the actual, you know, advancement and contribution uh, that is made by good architecture, by the various understandings of use, Use is not just functional use, but it's symbolic use, it's uh, social use, it's uh, all sorts of things. And, and that where, that's where it gets deposited, in the equity. So when architects are thinking about this, they're about creating equity. And the equity is for a variety of people. It should be for many stakeholders. It could just be for the developer 
but we like to make it, we, we as architects are able to take some of that away and make sure some of the equity is for the benefit of the community or the benefit of the users and so on. So just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. I think also then uh, as we're rounding off, perhaps if uh, Amy or Paul, uh, do you have any thoughts? Are you optimistic? Um, do you see the possibilities? Or where, if I can add, or where where should architects' optimism be placed? Where are the loopholes? Let's say. Well, I think the term loopholes is interesting, um, <laughs> because I think there's a distinction between being economically opportunist and being creatively opportunist, right? With the with loopholes, and if if you kind of go back historically to a moment where architects who worked for developers were really the scourge of the architecture industry. So I'm thinking after the Second World War, when the emphasis was on the welfare state and public buildings, people who made private or commercial architecture were not highly respected. They were respected by developers because they had, a, a, the successful ones at least, had an uncanny ability to know the loopholes, to get through the planning loopholes, to understand the planning regulation, to be absolutely amazing uh, decoders of legal language and had these incredible talents, but the reason they were considered to be um, uh, the kind of lowest of the low was because there was this understanding that there should be a distinction between the, mind, the intellectual mind and the kind of business mm -hmm. mind, if you like, mm -hmm. this distinction between thinking and doing somehow. Now, obviously, with, with all the structural things that shifted in the, towards the end of the 20th century, commercial architecture became the norm when, when there were, weren't the commissions for public architecture. And so these things have become kind of um, linked within practice, you know, like that you, you need to have an understanding of loopholes and regulations in order to be creative and to be productive. And what I think um, that kind of thinking in this uh, way that you have in terms of sort of imaginaries is sort of taking that one step further and using the loopholes to sort of um, uh, in a way, uh, reconstruct them. So I'm thinking, if we think about these zones, I want to go back to that question briefly about, you know, because these sort of territorial zones, they are purely constructs of legal language, right? The reason they are different is not because of the physicality or the kind of their territories. The reason is because written into the legal codes are tax incentives or they're de-territorialized, they're removed from certain sovereignties. But actually, I think the opportunities come in then kind of re rewriting that, rewriting those kind of using the language um, of itself to kind of uh, reinterpret what that means. Mm -hmm. um, the other other uh, moment of opportunity, which I think is interesting and actually goes back to something that DEGW or Frank Duffy from DEGW wrote in the 80s, which was that practitioners should not have a synchronic relationship with their clients where they have sort of all you know, a one-time uh, relationship, but they should have a diachronic relationship with users. So something that's continuous and ongoing through time. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting about some of your projections is that it, it promotes a kind of much more intimate relationship between the architect and the project um, beyond the point of construction. So thinking about kind of um, subverting the, the, what we might think of the kind of logical conclusion of a certain kind of architecture by actually continually monitoring it and working with it and adapting it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think interesting thoughts. So, Paul, do you have something to add perhaps? Yeah, maybe just two very quick ones. One, I think technology is going to play a part uh, to help us, uh, uh, I mean, you already see that in a lot of the digital technologies, the kind of uh, 3D printing, etc. that's bringing new kind of possibilities in uh, design uh, and also changing the ways in which we procure buildings. Huh? So I think uh, that is potentially, I'm thinking of the wiki house kind of uh, 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 possibilities there uh, of actually changing the ways uh, stakeholders interact with one another. But maybe my last uh, point uh, goes back to the kind of replica original uh, discussion that we had. And I also agree with kind of Radia that maybe architecture is about uh, crafty replication. I think that would be what I would uh, uh, propose. Um, I did a study a while ago where I asked uh, uh, what happens if somebody copies your design 
and I asked that question across different uh, sectors, and virtually every sector treats copying as a treason. The only, the only sector that thought it was great flattery was architecture. <laughs> uh, I think that maybe there's something that we can learn from that because uh, I guess uh, by replicating what the successes were in the past, we might be able to kind of circumvent a lot of the, the pessimism and the barriers and the hurdles that we face today. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I think with that, I mean, of course, there's uh, so many more things we can discuss. Um, I think many interesting thoughts uh, coming from, uh, from our invited guests and of course, uh, from the students' uh, projects. Um, but of course, we are running out of time. Um, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, thanks all for, for the very uh, insightful and intriguing discussion and the projects. No, thank you very much, uh, Rainier, Hans, Alex, our guests. It was a pleasure to have you, Paul, Amy, and Patrice contribute to the conversation, which I think, um, well, I'm curious how the students will react tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we will, um, after some reflection, we will continue our presentations week um, tomorrow with the presentation at three o'clock um, on the same uh, channel uh, on Project Global, which is exploring um, um, energy and its um, energy systems and the relation to arch its architectural objects. So uh, we look forward to continue that. I think this was a very um, yeah, erudite discussion and um, very, let's say, uh, maybe polemical instead of uh, provocative. So uh, we look forward to uh, seeing how the next iterations of the seminar uh, will evolve over the next couple of years. So uh, it's a pleasure. So um, everybody have a good evening um, or good afternoon, uh, Patrice, in your particular time zone um, until next time. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.